Welcome everybody to the IEA Bioenergy Webinar Series hosted by the Canadian Institute of Forestry. My name is Ronnie Huang and I'll be kicking off today's session. Today is January 18th, 2018 and we are very pleased to have Chan Libatro today who will present on methane emissions from biogas plants, methods for measurement, results and effect on greenhouse gas balance of electricity produced. We're also very pleased to have the task leader of IEA Bioenergy Task 37, Jerry Murphy, who will be introducing our speaker for today. With that, I'll pass it over to you, Jerry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the International Energy Agency Bioenergy Task. Uh, this report has been four or five years in production. It's uh, an extensive piece of work that you will find uh, online at IEA Bioenergy Task 37. It will also be on the main website of IEA Bioenergy. The report addresses methane emissions from biogas applications. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas and any fugitive methane emissions from a renewable energy production system are not conducive to the ambition of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Within the biogas sector, methane emission quantification is becoming a significant topic for the scientific community, but is still under development for the industry sector. This report addresses methods used for emission quantification. It presents results of measurements, empirical data. It proposes mitigation measures, and it puts methane emissions in a context of a standard greenhouse gas balance. Uh, a benefit of biogas systems is that typically if slurry is used as a substrate, there is a credit in that open slurry holding would release typically 17% of the methane potential, so we can have carbon neutral systems. The authors of the report are Jan Liebertrau, Torsten Reinelt, Alessandra Agostini, Bernard Lincoln, uh, I served as the editor. It was reviewed by Arthur Wellinger on behalf of the European Biogas Association. And the introduction today is from Dr. In Yang Liebertrau, who is currently employed as head of the department biochemical conversion at the DBFZ. He has a diploma as a civil engineer from Bauhaus University Weimar. Uh, his PhD was funded by DBU on the topic of process control of anaerobic treatment of organic uh, wastes. Uh, he has participated in several projects, including uh, at the Alberta Research Council, um, and he's been an employee of DBSZ since 2008 and head of department since 2001. He's currently extensively employed in projects related to monitoring of emissions um, and is currently working on a project on method harmonization within the EU. So I'll hand you over to Jan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jerry, for the introduction. And I would like to welcome everybody who is online now to this uh, webinar here on behalf of the authors of this uh, report, which have also been already announced. And uh, I'm thinking you are now all keen to uh, see what's in this report and this presentation. And I would like to start right here. Um, first of all, to give a general overview over potential emission sources on, on biogas plants. Uh, I presented here this uh, schematic of a biogas facility and in general you can say that uh, all digestate, every material which contains methanogenic activity uh, can be a potential source of a biogas, uh, of, a, of a emission. And of course, every uh, component of a biogas plant which contains biogas as gas storages, as uh, gas pipes, as flares, uh, CHP or biogas upgrading uh, facility, these all can also uh, lead to emissions. In general, we made a distinction uh, between emissions caused by construction so this is, for instance, if you have a CHP unit, it's very likely that you have uh, methane emissions in the exhaust and uh, emissions which can be caused by operation. And this would be, for instance, a pressure relief valve opening or a 
poor supply of oxygen to your post-composting system, things like that, which uh, are caused actually by the way how you operate your plant. We have different sources of emissions in the way that how we can describe them. So there are, for instance, point and area sources. A point source would be, for instance, the exhaust of the CHP. And this is usually easy to identify and easy to measure. Area source is, for instance, the digestate storage tank. You have a large area which you cannot measure in one uh, approach, so you have to have different methods to investigate point or area sources. Known and unknown sources, of course, leakages, for instance, are unknown sources, so you have to uh, find them and identify them first before you can measure them. Constant and time variant sources. Uh, constant sources are, of course, easier to measure because you, you just can make one attempt and then you can measure them, and uh, time variant sources, you actually have to uh, find out how the time variation of this source is, and then you have to transfer this variation to a longer period of time if you want to create an uh, emission factor. There are th several methods to uh, address, quantify methane emissions from a biogas facility. We have kind of distinguish them into the so-called one-side or single source method and the remote sensing method. I'll describe this a little bit uh, more in detail on the following slides. And there are a lot of different sub-methods, so you can't say the one method is done like that because there are different uh, methodologies to carry out these methods. There are yet no real standards for these methods, and there is sometimes even not a clear distinction between different approaches. Uh, documentation of the methods is sometimes poorly, so it's difficult to really compare what different uh, scientists or also uh, different um, uh, contractors have done. And, uh, Therefore, of course, the interpretation of such results is uh, sometimes difficult. Um, technology, biogas, in the extent we see it today, is quite a new technology. And so it's still under development. And technical standards are still under development. And um, that's why um, it's very difficult to really give an overview over the sector because a lot of new technologies are out there and they are still developing and we have highly uh, individual plants. Um, on the other side we also have on the measurement technology uh, quite a few developments so these gas cameras where you actually can visualize methane emissions they are quite new on the market and even the methodology, how to use them to identify and find leakages is still under development. Driver for reduction of methane emissions from biogas plants are in, in Germany, in particular, right now, mainly safety-related regulations. So there are only a few attempts to include methane emissions uh, from biogas facilities into actually permission, plant permissions or obligations to how to run a, a, a plant. Um, of course, the acceptance of the, plan, uh, of the technology, this is a very important driver, I think, to reduce emissions. In some cases, uh, for instance, in the fuel sector, where you need a certification to show what greenhouse gas uh, rucksack or greenhouse gas uh, load your uh, fuel comes with, uh, then you have to have a, a emissions uh, um, approve your emissions and show how many emissions are linked to your fuel. Economics, if the uh, methane losses are high enough, then it becomes an economic issue. And um, greenhouse gas reduction is a driver, but I would say within the operators, it is uh, 
mainly the economics and of course the acceptance which drives operators to uh, actually reduce their emissions. Um, I would like to explain a little bit more in detail what these methods for quantification are. We have here remote sensing and on-site single source measurement. Remote sensing usually works with the downwind plume of the uh, emissions. So the wind transports actually the um, uh, emission from the site uh, with it. And with some remote sensing methods, we are able to actually detect these emissions in the downwind area. For background measurements, you have to go upwind, of course. And uh, as you can see in, on the left side of this uh, slide, it's uh, uh, Jan, this area. Jan, sorry about that. Uh, sorry about the interruption. So which slide are you on currently? Four. Four. OK. So we're right now on slide two for some reason. I uh, see slide four. OK, one second. Should I continue or? Uh, one second, just give me one second. Sorry okay. about this. Apologies for the interruption. Um, Okay, so uh, we're back on slide four. Would you mind reading out the slide number once you move them, just in case? I'll do. Yes, thank you so much. So we are right now uh, on the downwind uh, remote sensing approach. Um, so as you can see on the, on the left side, there's uh, the, the green dots, the line from the green dots down here is uh, the background. And the elevated values, the red dots, is the downwind evaluation. And with some uh, micrometeorological models, you can calculate uh, with the information about the wind speed and turbulence and things like that, you can back calculate the emissions which have been caused by the plant. The single source me measurement is a different approach. Here you uh, try to identify and find every single leak, every single emission source on the biogas plant. And then you quantify every single source by different methods. And then you add all them up to the overall emissions uh, from the biogas plant. So these are two ways to actually get the overall emissions of the facility. I'll go now to slide number five to show you uh, the advantages and disadvantages of these two methods. Of course, if you identify every single source of a biogas facility, you know how much this source contributes to the overall emissions. And you can directly uh, transfer this to miti mitigation measures. This is impossible with the overall plant measurement because there you get only one value for the overall plant, so you still have to identify where the emissions come from. The uh, on-site single source measurement has also a very low detection limit because single sources you can really specifically address, and it's mostly independent from weather conditions. Uh, and the effort you have to take is usually adjustable to the requirements. So you can actually reduce effort if you just want to look for leakages, for instance. However, this advantage here is time variant emission sources are difficult to identify. If you just think about um, the emissions from a pressure relief valve and you just go there and have a one point measurement, you don't know how this valve behaves a month later or hours later even. Uh, 
you need to find all the sources in order to quantify them. If you do not find all the sources, because it's, for instance, time variant, then it's not included in your evaluation. It's a, usually a very high effort on large plants. So if you have a lot of digesters and a lot of little leakages, it takes a lot of time to quantify all of them. And some of the methods might even have an impact on the emission source, little leakages if you uh, install a blower in order to um, get the constant flow to quantify the emission source, then this might have an impact on the emission source. Overall plant measurement, you can install long time measurements with a higher resolution there. You do not have to interfere with the plant operation. You are usually located even outside of the original plant um, area. Um, there's some time effort, um, but it is independent from the plant size because you just set up the overall system and as long as you get the whole plume with, with your uh, system, then uh, uh, it's not dependent on plant size, how much effort you have to pay there. All emission sources are included. You, you don't have to identify them. And it, if you have a long-term measurement, also time-variant emissions are easier to detect with this system. This advantage, as I already said, you do not identify single sources, so mitigation measures are more difficult to uh, apply here. Um, you are highly dependent on wind conditions and uh, topology around the plant, so trees, buildings, uh, might uh, compromise your uh, system there. Um, there's also a certain uncertainty <laughs> uh, which comes from the dispersion models you apply and also from the uh, atmospheric mixing around the, the plant. And it's also sometimes difficult to separate other sources if they are really close nearby. If you have, for instance, a barn where um, yeah, cow manure is also stored, then it becomes really difficult to uh, separate this from the emissions from the biogas plant. So I move on now to slide number six. This is just the overview over the procedure for the on-site single source procedure. Um, I just want to highlight in here that for all these different sources you might have there, if it is the digestive storage, leaks, upgrading units, things like that, you need a specific method. So it's not always the same, it's dependent on the source. And this, of course, increases also the effort you have to take in order to get the overall emission quantification of the plant. Now I would like to continue with some uh, examples of uh, investigations which were done in Germany. We are now here looking at slide number seven on leakage identification uh, on plants. There are three different studies which have been evaluated here. And you can see on the, on the right side here that most of the leaks you find here are somehow related to the gas storage uh, at the plant. So membranes, fixing units, wires adjust to agitators, double membrane roofs. These are major leak sources. Um, and um, this is mainly to this uh, uh, system of, of storing the gas on top of the digester. Uh, most of the sites show leaks. This is the case, but however, the emission rates which come from these lakes, they are very different. So there are a lot of small, minor leaks and only a few really big ones. And this is actually a statistical problem, how to transfer from a limited number of uh, actual quantification of such leaks to an overall estimation how much such leakages contribute to the overall emissions of the plants. In particular, uh, the time, if you, if you, the time dependency, if you want to actually give an emission factor of a plant, then it's not only the point of time where you have the measurement, it's also a period of time, a year or maybe even longer, 
which where you have to refer to and how do you put a leak which you measure in such a time context how long the leak already exists and how this can be actually transferred to a longer period of time this is also a statistical problem if we look at the uh, gas storage component on most plants a little bit more in detail and you can see here on slide number eight a schematic of a double layer air inflated membrane roof this is a very popular uh, technology component in, in Germany and uh, number six here is a blower and this blower actually stabilizes the outer membrane and the inner membrane is flexible according to the gas which is produced and then this membrane is uh, unfolding depending on the gas which is in there then there is an outlet of the uh, uh, stabilizing gas uh, this is number 13 here in this um, uh, schematic and it's very easy to measure the emissions of such a double layer in, uh, air inflate membrane roof by just controlling the air which goes into the blower and measuring the flow there and also controlling the concentration of the target gas in our case methane at the outlet of these roofs and these roofs actually respond quite strongly to the uh, sun so and if we have such a system exposed to the sun then a temperature increase might occur during a sunny summer day and we've calculated here on this slide number eight, nine uh, actually the impact of a 30 Kelvin temperature increase on the volume which can be stored in such a roof and we have of course the gas extension according to the gas law and we have an increase of the water vapor if we assume like in this case an increase from 20 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius and this changes actually the volume inside of such a gas storage about 20 percent and what happens if you do not operate your biogas plant accordingly can be seen on slide number 10 here we have uh, the yellow line here which is the temperature and you see in the morning six o'clock around sun uh, really kicks up on the on the digester and then you see a temperature increase in the air around the digester and then the black line is actually the flow in a overpressure relief valve and this opens up uh, right after the sunrise and the temperature increase so the temperature increase leads to an extension of the volume in the gas storage the gas storage was already almost full can not hold the gas anymore and then the pressure relief valve opens to release the gas and in this really bad case it's actually released gas over almost the whole day so atmospheric conditions have to be considered in the operation of the gas storage and in a bad case like this one here they may result in pressure relief events when we look looking at um, emissions of these double uh, membrane uh, gas storages and uh, these are the calculated emissions here per square meter of membrane surface um, then you can see that there's a huge variation in the plants which have been investigated here this is a publication from uh, Joachim Clemens he has published this in Germany and as you can see over a thousand plants have been evaluated and he calculated this number just to see if these roofs are still within the diffusion threshold which is in Germany one liter of methane per square meter of membrane bar and day and the new threshold actually which was just uh, reduced uh, shortly uh, is now 0.5 liters and as you can see that uh, yeah it's almost half half if you take the old uh, threshold here and um, it's very difficult actually to distinguish uh, if this is now diffusion increased diffusion because the 
membrane is old and uh, therefore the incre uh, diffusion increased, or if there is a little leakage in this double membrane system. And for sure, we need a frequent quality control in order to make sure uh, that the roof is still working as it should work. And we need to have a threshold, actually, at which point the operator um, needs to take action. And this is difficult to distinguish between, uh, because um, actually, due to safety regulations, this, you just can increase the blower throughput, and then the dilution will solve the safety issue. But I think from the greenhouse gas um, perspective, such a number has to be in contact, uh, context with the overall emissions of the plant. Now we come to the uh, output of the biogas plant. So either we talk here about quite solid material, which might undergo a post-composting process, or more liquid substrates, digestate, which might be stored prior to distribution on agricultural land in closed or open tanks. This is an investigation we have done here on um, uh, bio-waste treating plants, and most of them have post-composting systems. You can see them with these black bars here. They stick out quite a bit here on this uh, graph. And as you can see, there's large emissions coming from these post-composting systems if they are not well-maintained. The black bars are post-composting systems which are externally. They are not included in the uh, covered and uh, connected with an air collection system on site, and they have been measured separately. In all the other plants, they might also have co post-composting system, but they are inside a building, and there's an air collection system, and this air collection system leads these emissions through the biofilter. And you can see also the part of the bars with the stripes here. This is uh, the emissions after the biofilter, and some of them also include post-composting emissions. What we can see here, there's a huge difference in these emissions. So uh, depending on the way how you actually operate your composting system, and usually uh, sufficient aeration and oxygen supply during composting actually reduces methane emissions quite a bit. When we look at the digestate storage, it's uh, also a very difficult uh, um, task to really analyze uh, digestate uh, storage emissions because they are time variant according to the filling level, temperature in the digestate storage, and of course you have an area source where it is very difficult to get representative results on a certain spot. Most of the time it's investigated with a chamber method and this only can cover a very little fraction of these large areas. And that's why I'm actually tending to support the idea of having a, a model where you take the remaining gas potential and uh, the filling level and the temperature and then calculate your emissions. In, this, in the figure here, you can see remaining gas potential of uh, digestate. These are the blue dots at uh, 37 degrees, so this is process temperature in these cases here, and uh, the gas potential at reduced temperature, which are supposed to simulate digestate storage, 20, 22 degrees here in this case. And as you can see, it's a reduced number on these lower temperatures, and it's a higher number on process temperature, which is obvious. Everybody who is dealing with anaerobic digestion knows that. But this has to be considered in the modeling or in any method which actually attempts to estimate emissions from digestate storage. I'd like to go a little bit more deeper into this uh, digestate storage uh, question here, in particular when we are dealing with manure. Manure has the big advantage that it is a substrate which comes with a so-called uh, credit, 
in regards of greenhouse gas emissions. And this is due to the fact that manure causes methane emissions when it is stored. When we bring it into an anaerobic digestion process, we reduce the emission potential and we reduce emissions caused by the manure. If we have now a co-digestion system, we introduce additional substrates. And the question is now, at which point actually do the emissions or the potential emissions from the digestate storage after the process actually are higher than the emissions, potential emissions from the manure. So when the emissions from the uh, manure equal the emissions from the digestate, which results from other substrates as silage, for instance, plus manure, then the emission reduction which I can achieve with such a system is actually zero. So I do not have uh, emission reduction compared to manual storage on its own. I've tried to put that in a graph on slide number 15 now. You can see on the x-axis the portion of manure and on the y-axis the remaining gas potential from the digestate. And the graphs are retention times, which we actually simulated. And the blue triangle here is the area where the emissions from the manure, potential emissions from manure storage, are larger than the potential emissions from the digestate of the substrate mix. And as you can see, for instance, we have here 100% uh, manure uh, situation. Then, of course, in any case, this is better than having no digestion. If you move forward a little bit, and I'll go here, let's say, for the 20% manure and 80% corn silage, and you can see that you already need 150 days retention time in this case here, which is this line here, uh, to actually not exceed the uh, emissions in your digestate storage. And this is actually a good way to, to estimate how your plant should be operated with which fractions of which substrate and which retention time in order to be still on the plus side with the emission reduction. And this is a slide which is also in the report uh, where this same point is actually put into a context of the methane which is utilized. And here you can see the 100% uh, manure process and you can see that this is actually constant over several retention times, what you can see on the x-axis. And this might look a little bit awkward, but it's actually true because if you think about that at 30 days retention time, you have, of course, quite a low emission safe percent methane, but you also have low methane utilization because you remove only a little fraction of the methane from the manure potential. And with increasing utilization of gas from the same amount of manure, you also have increasing methane emissions, so the ratio of this is constant. What you can see in this slide is that actually the manure fraction is the crucial point to the emission safe, and retention time has only a minor effect on this uh, factor, actually. So now I would like to move forward in the processing of the biogas plant. We are now here at uh, biogas and natural gas CHP units. And what you see on, on slide 17 here is the methane, uh, percent methane of the utilized methane, what is emitted from these uh, units which have been investigated here in different uh, publications. And as you can see that there's a large variation here, and this is due to the engine uh, type, the settings of the engines actually, and of course the maintenance, the status of the maintenance. Uh, 
I would like to highlight these two points here, and these are uh, biogas CHPs with a thermal post-combustion, and this reduces these emissions next to nothing. So this is always a way to make sure that there is no methane coming out of your system. I would say between 1 and 2 percent is a standard value for such emissions from the CHP. On slide 18, you can see the overall emissions from several plants, several publications. These are on-site methods, but also remote sensing methods, as you can see it here. And I would just like to highlight that we have here a variety of, of results. So you can start with 0.6% of the utilized methane, and it goes up to 5 or even 30% of the methane, which is uh, utilized. And this is simply due to the fact that we have different plant concepts. For instance, some plants have open digestive storage, others they don't have it. So there's a significant variability of emissions from these plants. We have, at some plants, also high variability in time. Again, digestate storage, pressure relief valve openings, uh, but also leakages are major sources of emissions. In one case, we even had that they had a couple, uh, two different systems for upgrading, and when they switched between the systems, the emissions actually of the site changed dramatically. And then, last but not least, we have different methods. This is something we have under investigation right now in a project, uh, which will be uh, finalized soon. So I will sh uh, also show you a slide on, on uh, the final workshop later on. Um, results are therefore very often difficult to compare. And it's very difficult to transfer the result of a point measurement to an extended period of time which you need for a emission factor. And it's even more difficult to actually generalize these results from a single plant to the overall sector. What we did now, finally, uh, is to put these results into a greenhouse gas balance in order to, to show the significance of these methane emissions within the greenhouse gas balance. And the method which was used by Alessandro Agostini uh, is uh, based on the theoretical and uh, simplified pathways, which were modeled by the Joint Research Center. And um, there are several publications where you can find actually the, the input values which have been used in this study. Uh, we variated substrates, energy crops, waste and manure, methane emissions, heat utilization and parasitic electrical uh, consumption here in order to, to get an impression what is the most dominating factor here. And we compared this all to the fossil fuel comparator from the EU, and this is set to the numbers you can see here on slide 20. Um, and we assumed that the bioenergy installation should achieve a 70% emission reduction compared to this fossil fuel comparator. So it should not exceed 30% of this fossil fuel comparator. Here are some uh, assumptions we made. I don't want to go into detail onto that. You can see this also in the report, uh, or you can ask questions about that after this presentation. And this is one uh, result, one, one uh, graph of the result. You know, the uh, colored area here is the area where the fossil fuel comparator, or the 30% of the fossil fuel comparator, is uh, still reached. And if the graph, what you can see out here, actually exceeds this area, then the uh, greenhouse gas emissions from this plant are larger than 30% of the fossil fuel comparator. In this case, we have a 100% corn silage plant. We have 0% heat utilization of this site. And we have a 5% electrical parasitic consumption. And you can see that this plant actually cannot allow even 1% of methane emissions, overall emissions from the plant. Uh, even then, it exceeds this, this uh, threshold of 30% which actually means that you have to have a post-combustion if you have a 
CHP on site because otherwise the CHP alone will contribute to such a uh, amount here. It looks different if you apply waste. This is a 100% waste treating plant here and then you can see you can allow already 4% and this is simply due to the fact that the waste comes not with any emissions. Energy crops you have to actually plant, you have to cultivate them and that's why this substrate comes already with a certain emission load. This is a plant 100% corn silage again with heat utilization and you can see that the heat utilization has an impact on, on the emissions. So you already can allow here 2% of methane losses which would allow a CHP operation on site but no other emissions. So you need to cover your digestate forage for instance completely in case of such a scenario here. This is manure digestion, 100% manure, and you can see in this graph that it not, not even reaches a, uh, uh, actually a balanced greenhouse gas emissions, so it still has negative uh, impact on the greenhouse gas emissions. And this is due to the credit which comes with the manure, which I already mentioned. We also investigated uh, co-digestion systems. Here again, the 100% manure. This is 80% uh, manure digestion with 20% of maize silage, no heat utilization, 10% electrical parasitic consumption. And as you already can see, even with this ratio here, the emissions allowed here are much lower than, than in the manure only um, system. And this is due to the fact that 80% uh, of uh, manure contribute only to one-third approximately of the gas produced, 20% mass-based fraction of maize silage contributes over two-thirds of the overall gas production. Last but not least, we have a 30% manure, 70% maize silage system here, and as you can see, you're very close to a balance like the 100% corn silage system because here in such a system the manure contributes only 5% to the overall uh, gas production and then of course the corn silage fraction is much more pronounced. To sum up the greenhouse gas balance, methane emissions and substrates used are crucial factors for the greenhouse, greenhouse gas balance of AD systems. Heat utilization can play a significant role in some limit cases, so as I showed for the corn silage system. Parasitic electric, uh, electricity consumption is rather of a minor uh, effect. Energy crop based plants need a heat utilization in order to achieve reduction target of 30% fossil fuel comparator. Assuming that there is a, a CHP emission as given. So I assume here that 1 to 2% uh, from the CHP is given. Of course, if you have a expensive exhaust treatment, then you can go even lower with your emissions here. Co-digestion of manure improves the, improves the balance, in particular if you have a large portion mass base of manure in your system. Mitigation strategies, we have a gas tight cover of the digestate storage, we have extensive uh, degradation of the substrate as options to reduce emissions from the digestate storage. Digestate post-treatment, if you have a solid digestate as, uh, from bio-waste and you want to compost it, make sure that you have sufficient oxygen supply there. CHP, uh, engine maintenance, uh, and there's also an option for post-treatment technology for the exhaust, but as I already said, this is quite a high investment here. Uh, frequent leakage detection is recommended for every plant, so in order to avoid large leakage, leakages. And the gas handling, uh, of course, operation of membrane gas storage systems with filling levels of around 50% under normal operation in order to avoid pressure relief openings. 
automated flare operation depending on the level of the gas storage and sometimes if it is necessary monitoring of the pressure relief valve that depends on your technical system adequate dimensions of any gas transport pipes controlled air supply for air inflated roofs controlled gas exchange within the storages in order to really access all your gas storage capacity and not having the situation that one storage is full and the other one is empty and the full one is already flowing over the overpressure relief valve. To sum up the whole presentation, we have uh, more and more results on single plant evaluation since we have a lot of projects in Europe in particular about emission of biogas plants. However, there's still unlimited knowledge about the general situation of the sector and uh, also a limited information about certain plant concepts. We have single measurements, but not for a whole concept. Uh, um, the results are difficult uh, to compare because we have differences in methods, measurement devices, documentation. Therefore, we need a method harmonization. Uh, and the plants need to be evaluated frequently in order to identify unwanted sources. This is what I also already mentioned. Mitigation measures include avoid or reduce emissions from digestate storage, proper CHP settings, maintenance, gas management, uh, and substrate change might be also a measure if you switch from energy crops to manure or waste material. This also can improve the greenhouse gas balance of the plant. I would like to uh, also advertise this workshop here for somebody who is still available in two weeks. Uh, we have in Lund, Sweden, uh, a workshop of a project where we uh, actually attempted the harm or attempt the harmonization of uh, methane emissions from biogas plants. And we would like to discuss the results of these project with everybody who is uh, interested in that. And last but not least, I would like to uh, thank Arthur Wellinger for uh, reviewing this report and uh, uh, three of my colleagues also for some formatting, counter-checking support and for some contributions they also put into this report. And you can download the report on this uh, web page here, you can see here and these are all the members of the task 37 uh, which actually uh, yeah the activity of this task is the reason why this report has actually been put together and uh, is presented right now here so that's from my side and uh, i'm looking forward to your questions in case you have some all right thanks so much jen so i will now uh, open up the lines for a question period, so just one moment. The leader has turned lecture off, and your lines have been unmuted. All right, so uh, to ask a question over the phone, please state your name, where you are calling from, and then address the question. Uh, you can also type in any questions and comments for Jan in the chat pod that we have um, brought up in the middle of the screen. Uh, slide 23, okay. Slide 23. All right. Uh, so we're back on slide 23 uh, from Mark. And then we have a couple more questions and comments coming in. As a reminder that multiple people can be typing in at the same time, so feel free to leave any comments or questions for Jan. Our first question comes from Mark. Is post-combustion uh, standard on CHP engines, or is it a special optional extra? Uh, post-combustion is not a standard at all on CHP engines. So what we have usually is a certain, or I, I speak now for Germany, we have a certain operational mode uh, with a high fraction of 
air into the fuel-air mixture in order to have low NOx emissions. And this causes a certain percentage of methane emissions um, because uh, the incineration is due to the high uh, concentration of nitrogen in the, in the chamber not as good as with lower fraction of air, and that's why we have a certain methane emissions. In some cases, we have catalysts in the exhaust because we have to reduce formaldehyde and carbon monoxide, but these catalysts are not uh, actually selective to methane. So they are not reducing methane, and there is also no catalyst, to my knowledge, available which reduces methane. That's why you need a post-combustion system. And since we have no methane regulation in Germany, this is not standard in such CHP systems. All right, so let's move on to our next question from Chris. There were more, oh, sorry. Uh, there were more numbers of CH4 emissions from the double membranes compared to the single membranes. Is this because it was easier to measure those systems because of the fans and point source? That's a question from Chris. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, on a single membrane system, you only can cover a certain fraction of the area and then evaluate diffusion there. But it's very difficult to actually find little leakages on such a membrane. And it's much easier to have these double membrane systems evaluated, and that's why in Germany now the uh, authorities would actually prohibit single membrane systems and would only allow double membrane systems because they are easier to monitor. Uh, question. For, uh, for the next question, will the slides be available for download? Is the webinar recorded? Yes, the webinar is recorded, and uh, the slides are will be available for download on the IEA Bioenergy website. So uh, visit the IEA Bioenergy website, or you can also send an email to electures at cif-ifc.org, and then we can send you the uh, slides and the recording. Um, our next question comes from Arthur. I just want to let you know that according to our detailed measurements with bio-waste addition of lots of air during post-composting might even increase the problem. It is extremely important to add air in function of the maturity of the digestion. Yep, thanks for this uh, comment. And so next question comes from Yang. For slide 30, okay, we'll bring it to slide 30. Okay, so um, for slide 30, improve greenhouse gas balance means reducing greenhouse gas emission. That's a question from Gain. Yeah, I think this refers to the last point here. So substrate change, manual waste materials. Um, yes, this, this okay. means exactly reducing greenhouse gas emissions specific to the uh, energy produced or specific to the waste material treated, whatever referred to, but yes. All right, so uh, next question comes from Ponzen. What's the difference in CH4 emissions between different biomethane production technologies? So membrane versus I mean wash versus water wash and versus PSA? Oh, I don't know by heart, I have to admit. Uh, in Germany, there is a standard which says uh, you can have, I think, 0.1% one, of emissions referred to the, it, let's say it's a certain percentage. I think that the new one is 0.1. And uh, if you do not, achieve this with your upgrading technology, you have to have a post-treatment. And then some of the technologies require this post-treatment, other ones they don't. From my point of view, I think uh, amine wash is very effective. They have very low emissions. Uh, membrane dependent on how many steps you have and how the system is. There are some publications on that. If you are particularly interested in these numbers, 
uh, write me an email, an email, and I will provide the information about the numbers. I don't know this by heart. All right. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mark. It's a follow-up question. How many plants use the mitigation methods indicates? Oh, slide 29. Okay. Um, yes. So the question comes from Mark. Very good question. Uh, um, so gas tight storage is, uh, in particular in Germany, it's a huge debate about it. Uh, so we have 100. 50 days retention time, which is uh, uh, actually people need to have 150 days retention time. Uh, it's mandatory in order to uh, achieve or to get the uh, tariff of the for, for the electricity produced. So we have quite uh, a degradation already there. Uh, however, gas tight cover of plants is still under discussion, and uh, in some cases, it is actually the authorities forced plant operators to do that. Uh, digestate post-treatment, it's hardly measured. So that's why most composting plants, they don't know how much methane is emitted there. And as uh, Arthur Wellinger uh, posted already there, so it's, it's really dependent on how you operate and how you do that. And so we are still in the process in telling people how that they have to look at this and have to do this. It's also, it's not only in digestate uh, uh, composting an issue, it's also in, in standard composting processes. If you have no uh, decent air supply, then even a standard composting process can emit lots of methane. Um, leakage detection, we have done uh, operator surveys, and uh, most of the plants have at least once a year a leakage detection. Either they do it by themselves or they have a, a contractor to do that. CHP, we don't know. We are uh, having, we are right now actually carrying out a survey on, on the sector to find out. And this is, is different. Uh, I mean, emission up means also efficiency down. So this is actually a point where plant operators should be interested by themselves. Um, we we don't know and the gas handling is also a point of concern of the authorities i already mentioned that they are now going for double uh, membrane um, roofs only they are also going for constant monitoring of these systems and um, over pressure relief valves we are now also in the process of analyzing this how often it's very difficult it's, it's quite an effort to to actually uh, assess this and I would say it's it's an issue in in a, in a fraction of the plants but I can now give a definitive number on on the sector sorry right um, with so our next question, I'm not sure if you've already in answered this, but uh, from Pavel, could you give us a global range of CH4 emissions as a fraction of biomethane produced? Uh, uh, I, I don't like to do that. Simply to the reasons I presented here, we have some evaluations, and I, in the report you will also find some, some numbers on what single plants actually emitted. And as I said, we are far away from having uh, an overall emission factor for the sector. We are starting right now a project uh, where we would like to uh, implement a lot of data which we gain from different sources in order to get an estimation on, on, the, on the sector. What we know now is that some plants are performing very good, and some plants are performing not so good. And, but we don't know how the distribution of this situation is in the sector. We don't know how many plants are good and how many are not so good. That's why I'm, I do not like to give a number like that, uh, because it's, it's, it's simply not possible from the data what we have already. 
Great. Uh, next question comes from guest four. When you estimate the greenhouse gas balance compared to FFC for co-digestion with bio waste, did you consider the avoided emissions as well? Thank you. Uh, I think I think we have also Alessandro Agostini here mm -hmm. in the the line, so he might answer to that question. Yeah, I'm on, I'm online. Yeah, I'll take this question and no, because we did not make the the co-digestion of uh, bio waste and manure. The example you've seen in the presentation is just about energy crops and manure, but th that can be done and. There, there's the database of the European Commission, which is online. You can use also the BioGrace tool to calculate that yourself. But in this example, it's not because it's just energy, cro energy crops and manure. Did I answer? Okay, thank you. Um, next question comes from Monique. Is there a general carbon footprint for electricity generated using CHP? So in kilograms, car CO2 equivalents per uh, kilowatt. I take this question as well. Okay. And yes, but it is the data we have seen so far. It, but it's in gram of CO2, CO2 equivalent per megajoule, not per kilowatt hour. But yeah, it's the same, just the unit. And then it depends on the specific technology. There are more data in the report. We have actually presented all the results for energy crops, bio waste, and manure. Yeah, yeah, but I think, uh, uh, Alessandro, I think the question relates to uh, the CHP as it own, uh, on its own. So if you, even if you use natural gas, is there a certain uh, standard value when you say, okay, if I apply a gas engine, I have a certain emission which is set as a standard with this gram CO2? I think this is the question. Well, it depends on the fuel. Uh, I, I, would, I would say it depends on the fuel and the the, 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 the methane which goes through the engine and then it's in the exhaust. So what, what do you assume if you have a, 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 a natural gas engine, for instance? What would well, be you, or? That, that's the fossil fuel comparator for natural gas, which is I don't remember, like 65 ah, okay. grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule. But then on top of that, you should add also the emissions, the, the, the greenhouse gases due to the methane index host. But a general carbon footprint for electricity generated using CHP, I thought it was yeah, about biogas, CHP running on biogas. Okay. All right, our next question is from Chris. Is the CH4 emissions from composting from the separated solids? Are you referring to solid in uh, brackets batch digestion? You don't mean from the liquid storage? Um, it depends on the technology. There are some technologies, uh, for instance, the, the batch one, solid batch digestion, which you are referring here to, they use the digestate as it is. They might add some structural material in order to compost it. Um, the, uh, the slide I showed, it contains as well batch systems with this garage style uh, digestion but also wet fermentation systems. And they, of course, have to separate first because uh, before they, they can compost. But this is all, uh, um, as you are in, if you are interested in these results, I can provide you the report. <coughs> Unfortunately, it's in German. But at least you get an, an, an idea what uh, the process looks like in this. Um, in this. So it's, it's actually. Depending on the process, both, it is possible that the plant actually separates solids and liquids, stores the liquids in an open, mostly open storage, and goes with the solids to the composting, or they directly take the output if it is dry enough and, and compost it. I'm um, not sure if this clarifies things, but there was a follow-up comment from Chris. He says he's referring to slide 12. Not sure if that. Yeah, helps. yeah, yeah. This is what I, what I just said. 
Okay. You, as okay. you can see, wet, wet fermentation systems, they for sure have a separation and then go to the composting. And the if it when it was possible, the emissions from the liquid storage was included in this in this graph. And uh, dry fermentation, they sometimes used it directly, sometimes had a solid liquid separation. Great. Um, next question uh, from Mark. Could the available leak evaluation methods be used for different processes? So for example, detecting H2 or H2S? I don't know about H2, H2S. I'm not 100% sure. Um, write me an email and I'll check with the uh, producers. Or you can address or contact FLIR, for instance, uh, too. So I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure because it depends on the, on the absorption spectrum and how if they really can make this visible. I, I'm not 100% sure. Right. Um, so just a quick reminder that in the interest of time, um, we'll just finish up these questions that we have on the screen. So our next question comes from Nabil. How do you deal with the carbon dioxide byproducts from the biodigester? Uh, I, so I, I think so far it's released in the atmosphere, but it can be used for the production of methane with some methanation, biomethanation or thermochemical methanation to add another product to the plant. But normally, I mean, if this is the question, when upgrading the biogas, you separate the CO2 and the methane, and you can use the CO2. So far, normally it's released in the atmosphere, but that can be used as a stream. CO2 stream for producing an additional amount of methane. We visited a number of plants in Holland and Denmark this year where the CO2 is a product and is used elsewhere, for example, in, uh, in, in carbonated water. And I think there was a mention of using CO2 in slaughter facilities. But uh, the CO2 can be um, collected and used as, a, as another product. All right, thanks, guys. Um, our next question is from Yu. Thank you for your nice presentation. Will the flexible operational mode of biogas plants increase the greenhouse gas emissions of the plants? Uh, very good questions. I have usually um, two points at what I mentioned there. If you want to operate your biogas plants in a flexible mode, you have to kind of increase your monitoring systems, improve your monitoring systems. You have to actually update the, the overall process control. In that case, I think you are able to more precisely control your system. And I have the uh, idea or the hope that this might lead to reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And the other way, if you have a plant which is not well equipped and they are then trying to operate in a flexible mode, then this might lead to increased emissions. When we look at uh, CHP, for instance, uh, it is very likely that either the on-off mode or part load operation will increase emissions too. So this is also a point which is still under investigation, where we really still have not really definitive numbers how, how this uh, will uh, unfold once we operate these plants in a different mode. But these two aspects, I think, are there when, when we talk about emissions from flexible operations. Right. Um, so. Our last question will be from Mark. So we'll finish up the ones that are currently in the chat pod. So uh, from Chris, what was the minimum HRT required and for what was it required for? Mm. Um, oh, OK. The, I think that refers to what I said with this 150 days retention time, uh, which is required in Germany for agricultural plants. And uh, I'll go to slide here. 
uh, slide uh, number 13 here. And you can see here, if you look at this 150 days retention time, then you see that at 20, 22 degrees Celsius, the, the most of the plants, there's only one plant up here, but most of the other plants, they are something around 1% of the methane, uh, of, the, of the gas potential of the substrate. And actually, the publication of this investigation here has led to the uh, uh, to a guideline in Germany which said uh, if we have 150 days retention time we achieve this reduction of potential emissions which we would like to see so this guideline was talking about 1 to 1.5 percent of emission potential in the digestate and that's why this 150 days retention time uh, was actually required. And yes, all electricity AD systems must have these 150 days retention times if they are constructed new. But these are all uh, um, uh, energy crop based plants. If you have a manure only plant, then you are not obliged to have this 150 days because with increasing amount of manure, you have large quantities of water, this increases your digestion volume, and then 150 days becomes really expensive. That's why 100% uh, percent manure plants have, are excluded. I made a comment from Mark. Thank you very much for the past fascinating presentation and the Q&A. A uh, question from Zhang. Can we compare different biomethane production technologies as well as different raw materials? Um, the point is what I already mentioned, that these uh, biomethane production technologies might have a certain uh, methane content in their exhaust gas, but as I already mentioned, most of them, when they have elevated methane concentration there, they also have a post-treatment. And that's why the, the greenhouse gas emission, as long as the post-treatment is functioning, uh, are as low as the other ones. So there is a little difference in uh, uh, due to the fact that if you have a higher concentration in your exhaust, you lose some gas. So this goes on your gas produced side a little bit down. But the uh, point that you emit high amounts of methane, and this causes a high impact on the CO2 balance because methane is such a potent uh, greenhouse gas, um, this is not this is not the cause in most of the plants because they have this post-treatment, so the methane emissions are very, very low. That's why such a comparison, I think, is uh, of, of limited uh, result at the end. All right, so we're now to our final question from Mark, our final two questions. Is there any evidence on how leakiness of double membrane changes over time? and are solid roof tanks less leaky than double membrane systems? Um, no, there is no evidence yet how leakiness of double membrane changes over time. We don't know. Uh, yeah. I, we, will, we will address uh, or we will contact within this other project I mentioned uh, some of the contractors who evaluate these uh, plants and maybe we get some hints there what the reasons are and, and how this changes over time. And uh, solid roof tanks, we had in some occasions um, large emissions from solid roof tanks when they had, for instance, uh, an, a motor installed on top and it was not properly sealed, or they had a manhole which was not properly sealed. Uh, so, but in general, I would think that a concrete roof is is more tight than a membrane roof. In particular, 
in, in Germany we had a very specific situation that uh, we had always to the end of a certain version of the Renewable Energy Sources Act, we had a big run on commissioning of plants. So they were installing these plants. It was usually at the end of the year, and it's not a good idea to install a membrane roof in December at low temperatures. And then that's the reason why, why some of these are quite leaky, because the connection of the digester to the roof is not very good. So, but other than that, I, I don't have a lot of information about uh, time dependency of these um, roofs. Great. Thank you very much, Jen. So I think um, in the interest of time, we will now bring this session to a close. So if you have any other follow-up questions or comments for Jan, uh, his information or his contact information is on screen right now. So jan.libertro at dbfz.de. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to um, contact us or contact Jan. Um, with that, I would like to bring this session to a close. So thank you all very much for participating in today's webinar. And once again, thank you very much to Jan for the wonderful presentation. So this was the IEA Bioenergy webinar series hosted by the Canadian Institute of Forestry. And we hope you have a great day. Thank you all very much.